So, um, so first of all, uh, I want to thank Wonkoms uh, for offering to do this. This idea started really just as uh, on, a, on kind of a whim. I was coming over to London for a conference the next couple days, and uh, I've been a fan of Wonkoms for, I was saying earlier, about five years now, pretty much since I started at Brookings. Um, they started about the same time I started at Brookings. And I was looking for a network in Washington of sort of peers that I could connect with. And I, in the process of looking for one, I found this one over in the UK. And I was like, oh, well, that, that's unfortunate. But um, <laughs> I've, stayed, I've stayed aware of it and have been really impressed with what Wonkoms has done. I also want to really thank Chatham House. Um, this, is a, this is a tremendous honor to speak here. Um, your reputation uh, is obviously well known in Washington in the think tank world and, and more widely than that. And so it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to work with some notes, and I apologize for that. That's the second time I've given this presentation, so I'm still kind of working it through. Um, and uh, I've asked Nicole to tell me if I go on too long, because actually this is a topic, and I'm going to set a timer, this is a topic that I could talk about for some time. Um, so, um, but I'll try, to, I'll try to stick to the highlights. Um, so for more than 100 years, Brookings uh, has been an institution, literally and figurat figuratively, on the Washington, D.C. landscape. Um, recognized, it's been recognized as the world's leading think tank uh, and a global knowledge brand. We've served as a place where the best ideas uh, come to be heard. Um, and we've also been a place where world leaders convene to discuss them. Its market for those ideas has historically been policymakers. Um, from the executive branch in Washington, the congressional branch, and then uh, government staff and government leaders around the world. That's, that's what I have come to think of as primarily a business-to-business -business model, to lean on the, the, uh, some corporate language. The products were delivered directly to the policymakers or to a small group of established media outlets, the business-to-business -business model. But since 2005, that model has become harder to sustain amidst a rapid and massive technological disruption of the media landscape. That disruption has included an incredible multiplication of media <coughs> sources combined with new ways of distributing information so that it has become harder than ever to look for legitimately credible sources to be heard among the general population. At the same time, policy elites have not been immune from this. So a congressional staffer in Washington is just as likely to get their information from Twitter as anybody else is. Um, a member of parliament here in the UK, I think, is just as likely to read a blog and be informed by that as anybody else is. Um, this obviously makes creating impact more difficult. The new landscape led to a choice for think tanks and other knowledge brands that were built to operate in a different time. They could hide behind the ivory tower and cling to the status quo or find new ways to share their work. In 2012, under Strobe Talbot's leadership, our president, and with the support of many of our scholars, Brookings chose the latter and entirely rebuilt the way it creates and distributes its product. Research and big ideas, once only exchanged behind closed doors with policy and media elites, are now being shared directly with readers online in a classic business-to-consumer model, again, to lean on the, the business language. While media still serves as an important distributor of Brookings' ideas and can never be replaced, we can also now operate without the filter of a third-party media organization. So go back 20 years ago. If, if a Brookings scholar or another scholar or another think tank wanted to make sure that something was heard, they would, determ they, would, they would do it through a media organization, and they would measure whether or not it was heard based on whether or not a media organization reported it. That's no longer an absolute necessity. Of course, none of this was easy. The biggest obstacle we faced was internal opposition from the scholarly community. Another was budget, a third was expertise, and a fourth was acceptance. And I'm going to take those in order. So scholars. Um, I know many of, you, many of you work with scholars in your own organizations, and they are the lifeblood of what we do. Um, we worked with the scholars to, to, to achieve our, we, our objective. We worked with the scholars who wanted to work with us. We generated results for those scholars, and then we shared that data, and we let the work speak for itself. And other scholars have joined, joined in different kinds of initiatives with us to try to bring about um, 
both different content and different outcomes. In terms of budget, um, we, like everybody else, even though we're perhaps bigger than many of your organizations, we, like everybody else, have budget limitations. Um, and everything that we've done in central communications at Brookings has been done on the backs of efficiencies, borne about mostly by bringing the work in-house. So with all due respect to our vendors in the room, the soapbox, <laughs> um, we currently retain a very small fraction of the number of vendors that were being used for communications when I first got to Brookings. In terms of expertise, and this relates to the former, we didn't have the expertise to do what we are doing now and what I wanted to do. So we had to hire it, bring it in-house. There was a gap for a time where you know, perhaps the skills we had in-house didn't measure up to what we were bringing in from vendors initially, but that gap was pretty quickly closed. And then on acceptance, this is one that we still struggle with, both internally and ex externally. I think that... Um, you know, I think certainly scholar, some scholars within Brookings and scholars outside Brookings don't necessarily see Brookings or organizations like Brookings as publishers the way that perhaps I do. Um, the data suggests otherwise. The data of how people are consuming our content suggests otherwise. But these are, these are long preconceived notions which are, which are challenging to overcome. The other thing is that media doesn't necessarily see us as a publisher. Um, which can sometimes make it hard for the distribution of content. But again, that's something that I think can be overcome with time. I think, so ultimately, we've accomplished what we've done by making our content, by making our scholars' content more accessible, whether you're a policy lead or just an interested reader, and by making our platforms more focused on engagement. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Um, I'm all right? Okay. Um, let me talk about the content for a minute, and then I'm going to talk about engagement. So on the content side, we started with things as simple as blog posts. The simple act of unpacking a 40 to 50 page PDF into multiple blog posts did remarkable things for making the content more accessible to more people, including, by the way, staffers who work in the executive branch or the congressional branch or in offices around the world. We hired a creative team that would feel at home in a tech startup or in a Hollywood studio, but whose passions lie in sharing the not in sharing uh, the kind of knowledge that we produce with the world. And they work with scholars to, to design products like these. And I said I was going to dip in and out of this presentation, so this is what I'm going to do. These are a couple graphic products that we've created about a couple of different reports. One is obviously more data-centered. This one is just meant to be more illustrative, right? So this piece on the right is a report that focuses on different, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? I can't think of it at the moment, but different personalities and, their, um, and what their situation is in terms of the working world. And so the pictures just simply you know, illustrate that. More graphic work up top, a chart that we put together. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We're going to talk about inequality and opportunity in America. Let's start by dividing the population up into five equally sized slices. If you're boring like me, you might call them quintiles. In an absolutely equal society where everybody had the same amount of money, each fifth of the distribution would get a fifth of the money. It would look like this. Of course, that's not how it is. In the real world, the bottom quintile, the bottom fifth, gets 5% of the money, and the top fifth get more than half the money. But I think in terms of fairness, and certainly in terms of American fairness, the question's less what's the gap between the bottom and the top, and it's more what are your chances of making it from the bottom to the top? How mobile is society? How far does where you're born on the ladder affect where you end up on the ladder? So in a, a perfectly mobile society, uh, an opportunity utopia, being born down here in the bottom quintile would have no effect on where you ended up. You'd be equally likely to make it to the top as to stay at the bottom. But now I want to show you what it's really like. Right now, for the people born at the bottom, more than one in three of them will remain stuck at the bottom, and just one in ten are going to make it all the way up to the top. Um, he has a new book out, by the way, called Dream Hoarders, which is fantastic if anybody um, is interested in that kind of subject. Um, so. 
I talked about, so I mentioned blogs, I mentioned video and creative products. We also built an immersive storytelling product, or what's more commonly known as long form, called the Brookings Essay. And I showed, I showed a graphic earlier that one at the top is from the essay. I think I may have a couple more pictures. This is the cover page to one of the essays. And what this is another one. And so what they are is usually 5,000 to 7,000 word narrative policy papers. Um, so they are character driven primarily, and they dig into a policy topic. And we add in immersive elements, so video elements, graphics, um, uh, other just illustrative features which help a reader pull a reader into the piece and keep them moving through the piece. And the idea behind these is really, again, to find a new audience for Brookings kind of content. We've launched podcasts. Um, three out of four have been consistently ranked in the top 20% uh, of all podcasts on iTunes. Um, I was saying to someone earlier today, uh, I recommend podcasts as possibly the best bang for your buck in terms of being able to do something that makes your content more accessible and reach a wider audience. They're just not very expensive to produce. I mean, you can sort of produce them if you want on an iPhone, um, or you can, with, with spending a little bit of money, um, buying some audio equipment, uh, and if you want to, even soundproofing a room, which really isn't very expensive at all. It sounds expensive, but you're basically putting foam on the wall. Um, you know, you can do a lot. Um, we've built a video game, which I think I have a brief picture of. Oh, that's the podcast there. Um, you, you can follow them all on iTunes or Stitcher or any other platform that you use. Um, we built a video game called The Fiscal Ship, um, which sort of asks, which asks, it's a very simple video game, but it's very clever, which asks uh, users to make choices about the federal budget in the United States. And, you know, what do you, okay, you're, you're, you want to spend money on this, what aren't you going to spend money on? As a, as a way to try to show how difficult it is to balance the budget. Um, so the catch, of course, is that none of these tactics on their own that we've used are particularly innovative. There are no shortage of good designers and good digital strategists around the world. I'm sure there's many people here and who work at your organizations who can do any number of these things. What is innovative is a business model shift of a 100-year-old organization from an inward-facing university without students to a cutting-edge publishing powerhouse. And that's the transformation that I, I tried to initiate and with Strobe Talbot's help tried to lead. As a nonprofit without advertising mandates and funded entirely by, by donations, we live in a unique space that allows us to function kind of like a media company without the typical restrictions of modern day publishers. Just a word about engagement um, now. So um, you can have the best content in the world. And if you can't distribute it, right, it doesn't matter. You all know that. You're communications professionals. Um, the content types I've mentioned have helped engage readers just because they're more accessible. But we also built an email program from scratch um, headlined by a product we call the Brookings Brief Newsletter that now reaches the inboxes of more than 200,000 people a day. Um, and that was really built over, it didn't happen overnight, that was built over about two and a half years. Um, we launched a light box on our site to capture emails of people who were coming to the site. And not without some resistance. People were not, not everybody was happy about the fact that we were putting a light box up on the site. But ultimately, you have to, to, you have to capture some percentage of the people who are coming to your site so that you can go, go back to them again in the future. You either have to capture them by getting their email or you have to capture them by having them sign up for your Facebook page, your Twitter feed. There has to be some way that you can touch these people again. Otherwise, they're just in and out. Um, we've invested in our human capacity to deal with social. We grew our social media uh, presence um, by about 10x. Um, and we have 15 Brookings Twitter accounts now with a combined following of over 850,000. Our Facebook page generates roughly 54 times more engagement than it did five years ago. And that's primarily by just doing things that you all know how to do to use a Facebook page, page effectively, focusing on engagement, um, making the content interesting, being clever with the headlines you're using, and so on. The catch, of course, um, sorry, said that. Um, I think there's a lot of positive things that other think tanks are doing. It's not just Brookings by any means. Um, the overall lesson is that most of this is actually rather quite manageable and requires a commitment more than anything else. And that commitment has to extend, can't be just from the communication side, right? It's got to be from the leadership of the institution. It's got to be 
Um, it's just got to be all, and from the scholars of the institution, it's got to be all across the board. Um, email is not, you know, as an example, email is not a particularly innovative technology, but you can do a lot with it if there's a commitment to be able to, to employ it effectively. Um, I can talk more later about the essay and the video and other things as far as advice on what you can and can't do. And then Nicole asked me to talk just for a minute about relevance in the post-fact era, if that's what we want to call it. Um, and so I want to touch on that. Typically, in Washington, there is a strong, I can't speak for the UK, there's a strong think tank contingent inside the White House, right? People move back and forth between think tank world and the White House. Um, and there are trusted sources within the think tank community. That isn't really happening with this administration. Um, there are exceptions. Um, there are some Brookings scholars, one that I know of for certain, and there may be one or two more inside the White House. Um, but there's no question that this administration is a different environment from, I think, pretty much any that's come before it. Um, as a result, it may be that it is a little harder for the think tank community to be heard at an elite level in Washington or even in the Congress. Um, at the same time, because of the tremendous amount of noise created by the contentiousness of the era in which we are living, it's very hard to be heard. It's harder than ever to be heard at a general level, right? It's hard to break through the noise. Um, it's all the more reason why I think it's so important that we do the hard work of distributing our content as widely and as effectively as possible. Because I think that ultimately, the think tank community is very well placed to is very well placed, I want to pick my words carefully here, is very well placed for what I think will be a backlash ultimately against the era that we're living in now. I think that there will be a, I think people will return to the idea that they want expertise, that they want facts, that they want credibility. And I think that it's all the more important that institutions like ours who are putting out good information <laughs> really work hard now to try to make sure that we're putting that information out in ways that are both accessible and will reach as many people as possible, as well as reaching the right people. Um, I think we have the ability to make the content our experts produce more accessible. If we don't do that, then we allow our experts' work to be, or to be misportrayed as elitist and misportrayed in its substance. That's harder for people to do when you have a scholar explaining things with Legos. That's what I'll say. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, a few questions. I'm going to use Chair's prerogative to jump in. Um, I'll ask a, a couple about the digital publishing side of it and your experience. And then I will ask one about think tanks in the, in the post-truth, post-fact age. And then I'm sure everybody has lots of questions that they want to ask. So um, I guess the, you have had enormous success at Brookings, I think that's fair to say, especially with the Brookings essay. Um, and I'm just wondering what kind of audience insights you have used to inform the decisions on you know, which kind of tool you use for which type of communication. So, I mean, from an analytics perspective, you know, we're using Google Analytics like everybody else. Yeah. Um, we have used some heat maps to look at where people are spending time on pages. Um, we spend a lot of time focused on, you know, penetration on, on pages to try to get a sense of what people are really engaging with, how far are they going. You mentioned the essay specifically. Um, early on, we did a bunch of work with video in the essay, and then we found that people either weren't watching the videos, or if they were watching the videos, they were watching the videos and then bouncing out of the essay. Right, okay. Um, and so we stopped doing that. And we started using elements that were a little bit easier for people to sort of engage with and then keep moving through, yeah. rather than stopping. Um, so I would say, um, I mean, I could probably think of a number of other things, but actually page penetration has been a big one. That's been a key, that's been a key metric. And the heat maps have been useful, and that's a tool um, you know, you can get fairly easily now and sort of see where people are paying, paying time and attention on the site. Okay, and uh, this kind of follows into my, you, met, you, you talked about uh, internal buy-in and, and having, you know, the, you're dealing with the scholars and the budget and that kind of thing. And I'm pretty sure that everybody in this room has had an experience where they are trying to convince uh, one of their 
senior management team about the value of investing in comms. Uh, and I guess wondering if you have any interesting anecdotes, anything that we could uh, use um, in our own. Uh <laughs> um. <laughs> like when you were so when you were doing the Lego video, yeah, I yeah. can see that being a really difficult sell. To someone who is it was I think. yeah yeah I mean I think it, Richard had to be Richard Reeves is his name Richard had to be sold on it uh, and I and convinced that this was not just a crazy idea once you know and I, and there was an element I'm sure I wasn't in the studio when they were going back and forth in the drafts but I'm quite certain there was a, an element of you know let's try this and see if it works and if you don't like it we don't have to do anything with it right so. But I think what I've been told by George Burroughs, who was our creative director, who was in the room and who shot it, was that once Richard started playing with the Legos, and then once he saw how the video was putting together, he got it. Right? He immediately got that this made what he was saying more easily understandable than anything he could write down, um, at least for a wider audience. Maybe not for the, for the experts, but for a wider audience. And um, that video is now used in college classrooms. Uh, as a way to explain social mobility and income inequality. So, um, so I do think there's an element of sort of convincing people. In terms of investments, uh, look, that's, like I said, that's hard. Uh, it's just really hard. And that's why I'm honest and upfront in saying I haven't gotten a whole bunch of new money to do what we've been doing. Mostly I've been able to try to reallocate funds um, accordingly to be able to do things. The point I guess I would make about that is to the extent possible, Invest in your people. That's where you're, and, and even if you have three people or two people, invest in your people um, and try to get more people if you can and train them up uh, because that's really where we've gotten value. I just, I love my staff. I can't say enough good things about them. They're phenomenal. I mean, I just watched another video product today that just happened with really without me doing anything. Um, and I have a social media team that, uh, I've been working on a memo for our new boss. We have a new president at Brookings who was announced last week, John Allen, General John Allen. And I'm working on a memo to General John Allen and um, you know, talking to my, the head of our digital promotions team, learning some things that she's doing that I didn't even know about that are fantastic. So um, invest in your people. That's the best thing that you can do to advance communications at your, in your organizations. OK, uh, one more. Can I, can I ask one more question? Um, one more on the. the digital publishing side. Um, what kind of, what do you think, other than investing in, in our people, um, and you talked about, uh, you know, putting foam up on the walls to see podcasts and that kind of, those like, you know, comms hacks. Um, what other kind of tips and tricks would you give us as, you know, we're definitely smaller organizations yeah, yeah, yeah. than yours, um, but those other, you know, what did you learn on the ground running with this? I mean, look, what I would say, I mean, uh, what I would say is that there has never been a better time in the history of the world, I don't think, to be able to distribute content cost effectively. So size is just not the issue that it used to be. I mean, it's always better to be bigger and always better to have more resources, of course. But you know, all you have to do is look at the fact that you know, there are people sitting in their living rooms or in their basements making content that goes viral and reaches millions and millions of people to understand that organizations with credibility and a couple, couple smart people and some good content can use these tools effectively too. Facebook is unbelievable as a way to be able to reach people. Invest in, you know, invest in <coughs> growing your audience on Facebook. Really focus on engagement. Pick something. Um, pick one thing to start with that you're really going to, if you're not, or if you're not already doing it, I don't mean to presume that this is not a 101 course, so forgive me. <laughs> um, but wherever you are, Assuming that you want to then advance, go forward, do something else, pick another thing and go after it. I mean, I mentioned email because it's, you know, it's cheap. It, with a smart strategy around email, you can just be so powerful in terms of reaching a new audience. And that can be, an email can be a highly targeted audience too, right? So you can, um, if you want to spend your time segmenting your email to be able to reach specific audiences that are really important to you, you can do that. If you want to, focus more on a general interest audience in a particular topic area, you can do that too. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned, you, I'm trying to think of anecdotes because you asked for them. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mentioned the light box thing. Mm. 
right? There was, there was a lot of resistance to that. And that was just something that I just had to push and push and make sure that we did because we had to be able to capture some element of those people. We're, and we're actually re we're revisiting it now because Brookings gets a huge amount of PDF downloads um, every month. And we've never done anything specifically to try to capture people's emails who come and download PDFs. And there's a number of reasons for that. But I think it's way past time that we do it because people who come to get PDFs you know, they, they're very, obviously very interested in the content, right? Whether it's for them or for their bosses, they're very interested in the content. So we need to know who they are. And uh, just shifting a little bit then to the post-truth age. Yeah. Here in the UK, we've had uh, uh, a lot of discussion around um, people being tired of experts. And uh, you touched on this a little bit. Uh, and I think, you know, yes, there may be in the future some kind of turnaround in, yeah. in that in that kind of public conversation around experts. But what do we should we be worried about this in the meantime? You know, are we should we be trying to how much should we be trying to break through? How much should we be quietly biding our time, weathering the storm? Yeah, no, I didn't mean to suggest we should be biding our time. Yeah. No, I think we all should be worried, right? I think that it's I think yeah. I mean I think it is a it's not a good it's not a good thing to be incredibly rudimentary when um, people want to uh, e when people so easily dismiss facts and knowledge and expertise and information um, and so I think yes we should be worried but what's to be done I mean what's to, I mean what we can do as the, it, with the organizations that we have and the expertise that we have is do our very best to distribute the content now um, to the people who need to see it. And that's what we try to do. Um, I don't know what else. I mean, there's no sort of magic, there's no magic bullet, right? There's just working harder. But I do think the accessibility thing is really important. I think it's, we, we can't, I don't think you can, dis, you can um, pay enough attention to how much noise there is out there and how hard it is to break through. And 40 or 50 page PDFs just for the most part are not going to do it. I mean, if you have a scholar or a, or a president or an executive director who has a direct line to the person who needs to make, who's making the decisions about things and they can get that, they can get the right information in front of that person, then great. If you don't, it's, the content has to be accessible. And that doesn't always, that doesn't mean Lego videos necessarily or video games or a Brookings essay. It can be a lot of different things. Um, but look, this is no, when I say accessibility, right, um, politicians have been reading, policymakers have been reading briefs forever. And what's a brief, right? It's a way to make really complicated, dense information more accessible. And um, so you can find your own path to it, but that, that theme is what I would stress. Mm -hmm. And I guess that kind of goes back to this idea of Brookings being a publisher. Yeah. And your role yeah. as an organization. Yeah, I mean, and I should say, I should be honest, and this is being live streamed, I mean, so some of my <laughs> colleagues back at Brookings have probably seen it. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I'm cer I don't think I'm alone in the idea of us being a publisher. Yeah. Um, but there's certainly not, I, I can't imagine there's 100% agreement on mm -hmm. that idea. But the way, the way I always put it is that, um, you know, people ask me if, like, well, are you competing with the New York Times? And I would say, no, we're not competing with the New York Times. But we are all competing for everyone's attention. I think that's, that's undeniable, right? When somebody goes online to find information about whatever it is, where do they go? Where do they go? And what do they do, right? <laughs> they search. And they find something. And all the studies show that they don't go past the first half of the page, right? And they click on something in the first half of the page. And if that source is the New York Times, that's what they open. And if that source is Brookings or Chatham House, that may be what they open. And so that's, you know, we're all competing for everybody's attention. And so the question is, um, and, and that person may be the policymaker that you want to reach, or it may more likely be a staffer for that policy person that you want to reach. And it could also be um, 
to put it in a, you know, in a, in my own context in America, but I think some of this exists here. It could also be a, you know, an important influencer for a member of Congress who lives in their district, who is about to have a meeting with that member of Congress, or it could, you know. So um, I think we are all competing for everybody's attention, and um, and so I it helps me to think of us as a publisher because if I don't, then I think we aren't living in that reality. Yeah. OK, well, speaking of competing for attention, I will uh, uh, see if there are questions. I'm going to take them in groups of three. I think that's uh, a good idea. I'm, I'm good at that. Okay. Um, so does anybody have any questions on either of those two areas? One here. Can you when you can you introduce yourselves too? It'd be helpful for me. <laughs> I'm a bit shy with the microphone. Uh, hi, my name is Gabriela. I'm from Brazil. My first formation was in marketing, and then, funnily enough, I moved to diplomatic studies here in the UK. And I have two questions: one in the marketing area field, and the other. Um, more involved diplomatic area. So the first one about oh, <laughs> about uh, marketing. About uh, as a thinking tank, should we um, change the way we, uh, the timing we post uh, we post things? So it's not only about the language, but also the timing because everything is faster now. So it's a world of fast fashion, fast fast food. So should we be faster to post, to reach our audience? So we have to uh, maybe, I don't know how to say it, but put a lot of information on online. You and mean with regard to the news cycle. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing as well is like the engagement. So should we look for um, a segment and see, oh, that audience is connected to my theme? Or should we just try to engage with them what they need? So what's the the question? <laughs> who, who came for who came first, like the chicken or the egg? So which kind of which one? And the other question is about uh, sci operations. So online sci ops, the bots that we have today, like misleading information. So how to combat that or? How to engage with that? Should also we use that the bots, the technology as a think tank? Yeah, the, the two ones. So in terms of in terms of timing, um, yes, I think you have to pay attention to timing. I don't think that means that you have that as think tanks, we should try to be news organizations and be entirely subject to the news cycle. What we do at Brookings, I can tell you what we do is um, we have a large amount of content. Over the, you know, that goes back years, obviously. And we try to resurface content that is uh, consistent with whatever's in the news to take advantage of that. Um, but there's definitely no pressure on scholars to produce content to meet the news cycle. Sometimes, if we know there's a scholar who's particularly involved in a subject which is, we know is going to be in the news in the next day or two, we may suggest to that scholar that they write a blog post to try to meet that topic um, where, it, where it is. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Um, but I do think resurfacing old content and trying to be familiar with that is really important. One thing we did during the debates in the United States, the presidential debates, uh, my team was fantastic. They made a spreadsheet before the debate, each debate, of all the topics that they thought were going to be covered and what content they had from the last year or two, which went along with those topics. And so then when those topics were raised during the debate, they would tweet about that content um, as a way of getting that out there. And they used the hashtags from the debate, so they were drawing the attention there. Um, on the issue of uh, fake news, um, it actually has it affected us a little, a little bit in that um, we became aware that there's a, a fake think tank out of Russia, which is posting content from our scholars um, as their own. Wow. And um, there's really nothing we can do about it. Um, now, they're not, it's not getting a lot of attention, thankfully. Um, but this is, this is a huge problem. Uh, and 
um, I don't want to sound simplistic or like a broken record, but I really think the only thing that can be done about it that's within our control anyway um, is to do a better job and be aggressive about putting our content out into the world so that people find it as opposed to um, other sources. And that includes things like you know, doing some paid advertising which does not have to be super expensive, but pushing your content out through Facebook, through paid, pushing your content out through Google, through paid, so that the people who, who need it and want it, find it. Katie Mantel right. from the King's Fund. And um, I was really interested what you said about podcasts, and you said something like um, you get the best bang for your buck out of podcasts. Sorry, that's an American expression. No, no, we <laughs> use it here. Okay, we know great. exactly what it okay, means. Okay, all right. It's a good expression. Continue to use it here. Um, and I was really interested in that because um, there's been some Twitter conversation amongst some of us while you've been talking about, you know, have any um, UK um, think tanks managed to kind of emulate your success with podcasts? And I was particularly interested because at the King's Fund, we did quite a lot of thinking about this about a year ago. We really wanted to do a podcast. And we ended up deciding that with the resources available to us, it didn't seem like the thing that would get maximum impact for us. And you're saying something completely different. So to get to my questions, they are, can you talk a bit more about the process for creating those, content, those sure. um, podcasts and how you kind of decide on content and... Um, present them and maybe talk a bit more about the impact they've had, please. Sure. Um, I should say, you know, my experience of them being the best bang for the buck is from our experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and, and what that, maybe it's helpful, let me go back and tell you a little bit of the story. So, we had a couple of podcasts uh, when I started at Brookings, and after about a year, I was able to focus on them, and um, they were generally not very good, and they weren't being, they weren't being kept up to date. At all, and so we had a meeting, and we talked about it, and said, like, let's do one really good podcast. We have a hundred scholars; they're all smart. Why don't we just sit them down and have conversations with them? We're bound to have good content out of that. And that became the first podcast, which we call the Brookings Cafeteria Podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, the process started really as um, one of our staff. We used an internal person who, th thankfully, you know, again. Uh, we're, we're very blessed. He um, does a phenomenal job. His name's Fred Dews. He does a phenomenal job as an interviewer. Uh, he just started calling scholars and said, I'm going to do this radio program. I'm going to do this podcast. Would you come over and let's just talk about your research? It's important to have somebody, if you're going to have somebody, if it's going to be an interview format, it's important to have somebody who's willing to do the work in advance to understand the research. Because what a scholar appreciates is someone who's actually read their work. Right? and can talk about it intelligently. And Fred did that. And so as a result, the interviews were very good. Then in terms of pushing them out there, um, you know, we had a Facebook audience, we have a Twitter audience, we have email. Right? So we used all our channels to be able to push it out. And podcast listeners are pretty loyal. So once they pick up a product, they, they tend to stay with it. And so what we found over time is that each podcast episode for a while was getting bigger and bigger and bigger audiences. And I forget where it is now, but if that's still happening. But um, so I guess what, what I'm saying when I see best bang for the buck is that, you know, with a person who's willing to organize it and relatively little equipment costs, you can take your content that your people are producing into an entirely different medium, right? And that medium makes um, people can listen to it when, when they're at the gym. Right? What impact does it create? Like all things, that's hard to measure. Right? But we do know that with busy people, audio is a good way to be able to reach them. So, yeah. One there and then we'll come to you. Uh, yes, uh, my name's um, Stephen Brown. I'm working in communications with the World Council of Churches in Geneva. Um, I had two questions. Um, one was the issue of um, PDFs and whether the PDF's dead. Um, I heard two messages from you. One was about the 40 to 50 page PDF, and on the other hand, you said there were masses of PDF downloads. So what, so what role does PDFs play, if any, within that strategy? Yep. And the second issue is in terms of the, the internal organization and 
what your authority is within the organization, whether it's, a, whether it's an authority of persuasion or an institutional authority, because one of the barriers that people come up against is the people that are working within an organization says, that's fine, but it's not for me. And so it's the question, how do you persuade or how do you, how do you move on? I will deal with that one very <laughs> d uh, carefully. Um, all right, so um, on the issue of PDFs, they're not dead. Uh, there is an audience for them. Um, we find that of our, so it's about 1,000 a day, so it's about 30,000 downloads a month. Um, we find that um, a good chunk of that, probably about half, comes from the economics world. Uh, and another portion of it, another significant portion of it, comes to our foreign policy content and primarily through the military and national security complex. Um, and then the rest of it is sort of spread out. So there are definitely some core audiences for PDFs. And I think you can probably imagine why in both of those categories that is. So I don't think we can just stop producing them. We may be able to stop producing them in other, some other marginal areas, not marginal, some other areas that don't have high PDF downloads. But in the areas that do, we probably we need to keep doing them. But even in those cases, um, it is what I was saying in my first point, it is important to be able to unpack those PDFs and give people an introduction to it, a summary of it, um, the highlights, right? Something that they can pull out and, uh, before and decide if they're going to dive into that 40 or 50 page PDF. Um, so that's how I would answer that. And then in terms of authority, um, you know, I have authority over my communications team and nothing else and wouldn't presume anything else. Um, I would say, you know, we have tried to be persuasive. Like I said at the top, we have tried to work with scholars who wanted to work with us um, to distribute the information most effectively uh, and, and in different ways and then try to show results from that and use that to persuade others to engage with us. And I think we've been pretty, uh, I think that's been pretty compelling for people. Um, and beyond that, um, you know, no, I mean, I can't, we can't force anybody to do anything. The scholars, as I said, the scholars are the lifeblood of Brookings and, um, and ultimately what you know, it, the place is there for them and for them to produce content for the world to see. So. And I think I promised you next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question was actually on your strategy to get the scholars on board with um, the, the bigger strategy of shifting and yeah. producing different content. Uh, I imagine it's quite a difficult. So how did you manage to do this? Um, how you manage to convince people yeah. to it's, come it's, along with you. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I should say, I mean, there's still, you know, there's still, there's a sort of, a, there's, a, there's a quite a number of scholars who work with us all the time on these more innovative t tactics. Um, then there's another number of scholars, I think, who do things like blog, right? But they're not necessarily going to make a Lego video, right? And then there's another number of scholars who, are perfectly happy doing what they've always been doing, and that's okay too, right? Um, how do we convince them? Um, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of something different from what I can, what I've already said. I think that um, we show results. You know, we show we we get some we get something that we've done, and we show how it's worked. I mean, this video game, for example. Um, I wish I could show it to you. Um, I mean, it's, you should go take a look at it. You know, I think this was done on our economics division, which I, was, I, mean, I was really happy because the economics folks are, you know, tend to be some of the more conservative about how they present their content. And rightfully so, I understand that. Um, this was done with David Wessel, who's a former journalist. David had a media background, and so he was willing to be, um, you know, he's willing to think a little bit outside the box in terms of how the content would be presented. Uh, but then people saw this, and we've since done another video game uh, because people thought, oh, that's interesting. Can we, do, can we do more of that? So I think um, find something. 
that you, that you can do with someone and show results. That's really, I hate to be simple, but that's really what it is. That's really what it is. Yeah. I think right here, too. Yeah. It was right across the. She's had her hand up a few times. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just interested in how, what, what, what proportion of things, innovative things like that, or you know, the game or the video, you do because you know there's an audience there for it, or how much is it about, we have a hunch that this is going to be popular. How much research is going on it to define your audience for something like that, compared to how much it's your team thinking, I'd love to do something like that, and then it works. Leonor was always going to ask the question. <laughs> Um, I mean, there's no way to really test straight away if a video game is going to be effective in reaching an audience, right? What we, what we are confident of is that in the modern publishing environment, you have to reach people through a variety of channels. And that creativity combined with effective content is ultimately an effective mechanism for um, for reaching as wide an audience as possible. So, you know, if, if we just keep producing blogs, that's going to get old and boring and uninteresting pretty quickly. If we just produce video of the same type, same thing, just podcast. So we are, one of our, we have a strategic plan that talks about, you know, our strategic assumptions and which I call the rules we live by. And one of those is that we are innovative. And so I try, we, tr we try on the team to constantly be pushing ourselves to be, to be innovative. And if we just find ourselves doing the same things over and over and over again, then we challenge ourselves to try something new. And that's where ideas like the video game come from. Um, so no, I mean, I don't have specific metrics. I mean, it, the podcasts, I will say, there was a bit of metric work there because there was already an audience for podcasts. Like the, it was clear there was all kinds of literature about it. Or Facebook or Twitter, right? We have scholars who come to us and say, why should we be on Twitter? There's plenty of data to show why a scholar should be on Twitter. So I don't want to make it sound like we don't have any, <laughs> that we're just flying by the seat of our pants because that's not, that's not true either. Um, but it, is also, it also wouldn't be true to say that um, we only do things for which there is data to demonstrate that it works. Because sometimes there isn't data, um, and that's part of being innovative. Yeah, and I think that's quite encouraging, actually, to those of us who want to try and encourage our teams to be able to be creative. And we work with researchers and analysts who will always want proof. You know, so it's quite, it's quite encouraging to yeah. hear that there's not... <laughs> Sorry, I'm dominating there. <laughs> no. Hi, actually it's quite con linked uh, to your question. My name is Eileen Martinez and I work for the Overseas Development Institute. And I think one of the biggest challenge that we have in comms and also with the researchers is about impact. So, you know, we have lots of metrics now, particularly with digital, you can measure likes, reach, mm -hmm. you can measure to some extent engagement with, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but how does that translate to impact? How do we make decisions based on what is going to be more impactful? And maybe sometimes that is an old format or a conversation or a brand new product. So I just wanted to get a, a sense from how you measure impact in your in your comms team. It could be product based. It could be in a strategy yeah. based. Uh, and and I, how you link that with audiences uh, and how you get to know the audiences. So do you do any audience mapping and any any insights that you can Good That's questions. <laughs> um, so one of the things I like to say is that is that comms creates the opportunities for impact. Um, I don't think that we create impact ourselves, right? We open the doorways for scholars to walk through and engage a staff person or a member of Congress or, or a, a head of government overseas or whatever it might be. Um, but I do think, you know, it's it's our responsibility to try to measure if we're reaching the right audiences. And so I think one of the things, one of the things we look at is um, certainly click-through rates through core audiences, right? So if we do targeted email sends, looking at the click-through rates, looking at the page 
penetration for people who come through those channels, looking at the time on site, looking at share rates of people who come through those channels, um, looking at share rates of or, or shares of media influencers on Twitter of different pieces of content, um, looking at media pickup from social shares and those sorts of things, and people writing about that. Um, looking at um, Well, targeting, so, so paid targeting into core audiences, and then looking at the ROI on click-through rates from paid targeted ads, which we don't do a huge amount of, uh, but for, again, for a relatively, co for a cost-effective amount of money, you can do some good paid targeting on Facebook and, and through Google AdWords, and so doing some of that. Um, I'm just wondering on that one, sorry to jump in, is that the, the, the paid for advertising, do you do that project specific or just general, um, you know, have a chat Both. house thing follow you around on Both. Facebook? Okay. Both. So we do, um, actually there's, so there's kind of three kinds. We do, we, we promote content that we think will be useful in pulling people into the larger Brookings universe. Right. We do specific project specific content that the programs ask us to do. Um, and sometimes they even have budget to throw in to promote it themselves. And so we'll manage it, but they'll, they'll throw in some budget for it. Yeah. And then we have done general, you know, follow Brookings. Get, you know, we've tried different messages. Get more information about, you know, X topic or um, get smarter. You know, that sort of thing, right? Impress um, your friends. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we've done that, I think. Um, you know, uh, come up with good cocktail chatter. Yeah. Um, and we get people to follow us on Facebook in that regard. Because, again, what it's, there's a portion of this which is about just getting people into your orbit so that they are aware. Um, but it is, I mean, I mentioned, so those were, that, that was four or five things that I mentioned, I think, that we try to do. But it is hard. I mean, it is very hard to know if you are actually, if these channels are actually creating an impact. Um, oh, some of it comes anecdotally, and that's not nothing either. Um, so, you know, a scholar will go up on the hill and talk to a staffer, and they'll say they saw something, right? Um, so, I mean, but one thing, I guess, one tip I could give you, how many of you do events? Okay. Um, tell me the impact from the events, right? It's, it's really hard. You know? well, media coverage or engagement on social. Right. Probably the two main things, but anecdotal as well. Right. Definitely. Right. It's important for Chatham House for, for members. Right. All, all the same things that I was talking about with digital, right? Mm -hmm. The one difference being that, of course, in an event, you know, you know if somebody physically comes into the room and they're there. Um, that doesn't happen that much, though, at least in our world, where you get uh, private events, yes, but public events, you know, I mean, it, you know, you don't get um, a private event is entirely a different animal, but a public event, you don't, you're not going to get a, an audience full of influencers, right? It's a mix. Um, but I think events are something that people are accustomed to, and so it's easy for them to say, oh, sure, we'll spend five thousand dollars putting together an event, bringing people in the room. When I, early on when I started at Brookings, uh, I came up with, uh, I had some data and I would go around and I would say, look, it costs us, um, I think, I'm trying to remember now, it's been a while, I think it was about $35 to $40 a head to put someone in a chair at a Brookings event, right? Whereas the cost of doing a video or the cost of doing, you know, paid advertising or whatever it might be was pennies on the dollar compared to that, right? But an event was, people were comfortable with that. It was an acceptable way to be able to say we're generating impact because we put people in a room at $30 a head or $35 a head. That, I think, had some, to get to one of the other questions that was asked, I think that had some resonance um, and gave us a little bit of space to be able to run. Now, we still do 200 events a year, but it is down. Um, it is down. Our, our, one of our programs in particular, which I won't mention, but one of our programs in particular has fairly dramatically reduced the number of, event, of events that they do because 
it's not super cost effective for them to do them. And they're trying other things, and they're doing some other things. Uh, Tom Hampson from uh, Soapbox. Uh, we're a policy communications agency. Um, I've got a, a question about the kind of wider effect on uh, the organisation more broadly. Um, how much have the kind of quite significant changes that you've made, how much are they seen by the rest of the organisation as a sort of comms activity, essentially? And how much have they actually, or alternatively, how much have they ended up actually really affecting the way that scholars and researchers work from the get-go, from the kick-off of projects from the kickoff of, of, uh, of uh, research work? I would say, you know, um, to on the latter point, sort of how much has it been something that scholars now absorb and, and do, I think it's been a progression. Um, and every quarter it seems like it's a little bit more and it's a little bit more. You know, we have more scholars coming to us, sitting down with us, wanting to work, going, wanting to work uh, on creative ideas. Each of, I should say each of our five research programs has excellent, a small number of excellent communications people within their own teams. And so they experience it too. The scholars will come to them and say, what can we do that's different from what we've done before? And usually what will happen is that that comms person will bring them across the street. We're, we're actually literally across the street from the main building. Bring them across the street and sit down and talk with us about creative ideas um, for what could be done with the content. Um, we just did a the video I was looking at tonight was about, um, well, I don't want to say, but it, it was about a topic that came up in just that way with a scholar sort of asking what else can we do and led to a creative conversation. Yeah. So we're almost at the end of time. I'm going to take. I'm fine, by the way. So whatever. Did, if there was a question. Well, Kate, this is, this is your home, this is your, <laughs> this is your house. Um, I'm just saying you don't need to stop it for me, but, okay, that's, I'll, but that's fine. Do whatever okay, you want. I'll, we'll take those two questions and then end with Keith, and then Dave is not going anywhere, and uh, drink and nibbles, so yeah, yeah. we don't want to get <coughs> into that time too much. It's rare that I'm not home with my family, so <laughs> it's fine. Just a really quick one. Penelope Gibbs from uh, Transform Justice. Um, do you do anything with LinkedIn? Ah, good question. Um, so we do, uh, we have put some real energy into building out our LinkedIn page um, and seen some real growth in that regard. Um, not huge, well, huge percentage-wise, but I think it's, it still pales in comparison to our Twitter and um, Facebook followings. Um, but we did start paying some attention to it and have seen some results from it. Um, we don't do anything with them in a paid context because they're still very expensive relative to Facebook or, or Twitter. But we have seen some good work or good stuff organically. I'd also say, you just made me think of something else. Um, we've put some energy into Medium, um, for those of, you, those of you that are familiar with Medium, and have seen some really good results there. Um, and that's a relatively easy one to do because we're, we're pretty much just reposting content. Uh, and it finds a new home on Medium. It's just a different channel. And some things, some things do particularly well on Medium that and weren't necessarily do doing well. You could do it from an institutional perspective, or you can do it from an individual basis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, leave. Oh, let's another question. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't see. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, while you're there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sorry, Helen from the Overseas Development Institute. I just have a quick question about funding. Um, I think you're very lucky that you work with a range of foundations and you're very open-ended funding. We work on a project basis and it's very difficult yeah. to justify communication spending over research spending. I was wondering, have you found some foundations better or worse to deal with in terms of funding communications outputs and how do you justify this kind of expense to them and the kind of impact you get off the back of it? So I don't mean to, I don't want to dodge the question, but I don't deal with funding that much, so I can't speak to it from that much of a knowledgeable place, but I'll tell you what I know. Um, so we are funded, our central communications office is funded um, off the funds that our research programs raise. Um, but they are very much project-based, like you were describing. I mean, everybody's dealing with a restricted giving as opposed to unrestricted giving scenarios. So we can't just do whatever we want. Um, they, when they raise money, they try to identify communications outputs that they're going to seek to achieve, and then they come to us. We 
we've tried to do two things. We either try to encourage them to give us latitude when they're writing those things, or to talk with us in advance to try to get ideas to put into the proposals. And that's been an ongoing process as well um, of doing that. I think that, yes, from what I understand, some foundations, some donors are you know, more progressive, more out there in terms, of, uh, in terms of what they're looking for from a communications perspective than others are. And, and, and a couple forums that I've been at in the last few years with donors, I've tried to say, ultimately, this has to happen from you. You have to be the ones asking. Donors have to be the ones asking for this. Um, because otherwise, you know, the institutions are going to be too afraid to try to invest in things that the donors don't want. But I do think more, more donors are becoming aware of this and conscious of it. He's been very, he's been very patient. Hi, I'm, I'm Brees. I'm also from the Institute for Government with Nicole. Um, so I have two... Yes, favoritism. Um, so there's one main question, one sort of quick question. Sorry, I'm being greedy. Um, in terms of the M and E side of things, how do you manage that from a human resources and management perspective? So, how much time do you spend on it, and how do you feed it back into like management meetings or team meetings? Like, how how does that f process that flow work for Brookings? Um, clearly, you're very good at it. Yeah. And then a second question is on networks. So this is kind of following on from the point about podcasts. Having tried to do podcasts and done them, and you know, getting not much traction. Now, actually, we you know, our tactic is like getting our experts onto podcasts that are already established with huge networks. Yeah. Um, you know, what's, is that better than trying to just you know, grow your own following organically? I don't, know, so. I don't know if it's better. I certainly don't think there's anything wrong with that approach. Like that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're um, depending on who the organization is, you know, that may be a, a better way to go. The m important thing is to recognize that podcasts are a medium it is real, people do listen to these, and that in many cases the people you want to listen are listening to these. Um, just because it's a, it, it tends to be something that people who are busier and um, uh, professionals pay attention to. That's what the data seems to suggest. Um, to the point about m and &E and human resources, I just want to make sure I understand the question. You're asking me, how do I evaluate my staff's performance? Is that? No, it's more about the data that you collect on digital and websites and things like that, and how do you then as a team, look at that data and feed that in, feed that like, the, in. like in a like a day to day a practical sense. Yeah. Or how do you convince management about sort of the merits of certain projects? Like, where, where, in what yeah. forms do you do that? So, you know, I'll be a bit transparent here. Um, analytics was something that I focused on for my very first days five years ago at Brookings, and it's probably the place where I feel like we have made the least amount of progress, like substantial progress in terms of what we do. Um, and that's been for a variety of reasons, which I don't need to go into. And I don't mean to suggest that we're doing nothing. That, that wouldn't be right either. But I just, there's certain things I, I could talk about it more separate, privately or something. But it, it's just been, um, it's been a big challenge. And what I would say is we do collect data. Um, in fact, we just hired a great new person um, from the Atlantic uh, magazine. And she's helping us. Um, we, ha we do have a vendor um, who we're working with on it, and we are putting some new strategies in place to, uh, to try some new things. But generally what we've done over the last five years at different points in time is focused on analytics from specific projects and specific outputs and looked at what we can learn from those pieces to inform other work. So I mentioned like on the essay, paying attention to what people were doing with different elements of content on the page and then learning from that what we do with that. Or paying attention to how people interact with new templates that we develop for the website. So we have some new templates. We've had some templates over the years which have been very creative and fun to look at and all of that. But we've really tried to pay attention to what the data is saying about how people are interacting with those templates. And if they aren't effective, trying to make the argument to people who might ask for them that, hey, this isn't really working. All your, you know, it looks good, but it's not really doing anything for you. So um, my answer to your question would be we have done it on a project by project basis. And we are now in the process of really trying to make another run at doing it in a very comprehensive way so that we can focus again more aggressively on the questions of impact um, and, and cycle those back into learning. I have a, I don't want to go on about this. I have this chart, which my staff affectionately calls the sol solar system chart. Um, 
which was my vision early on, which um, I can't draw anything here. I, I tend to draw things. At the center has content, right? And then has um, publishing, and then has promotions of the content, and then on the outer ring has analytics. And then there's an arrow coming out from the content, out through analytics, and back down into the content. So if you think about it as you, you've got your piece of content to start with, that content passes through a publishing channel right, on the website, what you do with it there. It passes through a promotions channel, social, email, paid advertising, all these things. And then finally, it passes through an analytics channel where you're collecting data on all the things that you were doing. That should then feed back into the content and should, it, should adapt that content to what you've learned and should adapt future pieces of content to what you've learned. That's the part that we've done sporadically and we're going to make another run at doing comprehensively. Yeah. Right. It's a broader question about Xbox. Go ahead. Why not? Yeah. We've, yeah, we've been really in the weeds. Let's do so, it. Let's yeah, it exactly. We so, finish. Keith, we're in the Chatham House. <laughs> um, just to go back to your point about expertise, and you're kind of rather optimistic, as I think I would be, that in time, people will turn back to experts, choice, realize yeah. the value. Yeah. <laughs> in the meantime, um, I think, you know, it's very true to say that pretty much all Chatham House experts were on the wrong side of the debate Brexit. on Brexit. And certainly my sense of Washington is most of the think tanks, most of the people I know and deal with, were on the wrong side, if you like, of the, uh, of the US election. Um, has there been a shift, either at Brookings or other think tanks in Washington, to move more to, not just to inform, but to influence and change minds? Is, is there a shift in that sense? Because I think one of the things that we felt was, actually, we didn't really, we informed. We were part of the debate. We had good discussions here with uh, our platform as an objective platform, so we had both sides of the argument. Um, but we clearly didn't manage to change too many minds or as many minds as perhaps we would have liked. Are you having the same discussion there? Um, and I don't, if I don't so, how's I, it playing out? I haven't noticed a huge discussion within Brookings about how to actively try and change minds. We're not an advocacy organization. There is definitely an effort to try to understand what happened, um, both publicly and privately within the institution, um, and to try to understand what we missed, what the scholars missed um, about what's going on in the country. And I think, uh, I think maybe it's safe to say that the hope is that if we can un do a better job of understanding what was missed, that maybe we can do a better job of speaking to, um, you know, of speaking to what people want to hear. Um, we do want to. I mean, every all of us want to be relevant, right? That's the thing. We all, we all want to be relevant. Um, but no, we don't. We don't advocate. I mean, that's not. We're not trying to. We're not. And I also think one has to be really careful. Just speaking entirely for myself right now, I think one has to be really careful about trying to convince people that they were wrong. Right? Because maybe, you know, maybe they weren't wrong from where they sit. And, that's, and that sort of speaks to the gap, which is increasingly getting wider, between where many people live in the United States, and I suspect in Britain, and where the people who sit in these kinds of rooms live. Right, well, um, as I said, David is not going anywhere, so you can uh, pester him over some uh, drinks and nibbles uh, outside. And uh, the live stream audio wasn't working so for the first couple minutes, so people watching our live stream, wherever that camera is, um, we're going to try to put the slides online and, uh, and the video after. So thank you very much to our hosts, and thank you very much to David for taking the time to do this today. I've, I've, I've learned loads already, and I'm going to dazzle my... Director with so thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.